powerful collaborations, cutting edge science, and curious minds coming together for a glimpse of the future. Stay tuned as we look at the latest updates on some of the most promising technology projects. Hello and welcome. I'm Peter Ballant from Technicon, and today we look at the future TPM project. In simple terms, this EU-funded project will ensure that computer systems protected by modern standards can keep up to the sheer force of quantum computing, which is coming. There is a lot to be done in this area, but the future TPM consortium has achieved quite a bit in the last few years. They wrapped things up in December 2020, so now is actually a good time to check in and get some details. Today we are joined by Silviu Lashanu from project partner Huawei. Unfortunately, we were not able to record this podcast face-to-face, -face, but we're happy to be speaking remotely. Thanks, Silvio, for taking the time to share your progress with us. Yeah, thank you for uh, the invitation. I, I'm honored to participate in such a podcast. And uh, yeah, it's true that uh, being remote is not the easiest thing to do. But on the other hand, probably our listeners would be also remote when they would listen to it. So I hope it won't make such a big difference. Good point. Good point. So you are working on a project which is called Future TPM. And if someone looks this up online, they would find your webpage and they would see that TPM stands for Trusted Platform Module. What can you tell us about this, a TPM? Is this hardware? Is it software? Is it a process? Mm -hmm. Traditionally, uh, a TPM is a small crypto processor, so a small chip which provides crypto functionality, which is uh, commonly integrated in uh, laptops, uh, desktop computers, servers, which recently has been seeing an increase or, or a substantial uh, adoption uh, increase in also other types of devices like smaller consumer devices, IoT, but also network devices and uh, so on. And, and the reason is because the TPM provides uh, these crypto functionalities uh, in hardware and this means that they are better protected and uh, less susceptible to um, interference from, let's say, your operating system. And uh, as I said, traditionally, it's a hardware device. However, uh, we often have also software implementations, which we use for development of various functionalities using a TPM, so more like an emulator. Or uh, we also have what we call virtual TPMs, which are sort of software implementations which run on uh, cloud infrastructure, for example, to provide virtual machines with a TPM-like functionality. And I think this maybe leads into the next question, which is what consumer devices that we might know of or we might be familiar with are protected today by a TPM? Mm -hmm. Probably the most uh, ubiquitous use of TPMs is in laptop devices. So most likely if you if you use a windows or linux based uh, laptop these days it will have a tpm inside and as i mentioned it has been expanding in, in recent years also to uh, less consumer devices but rather more enterprise or telecom devices like servers and routers and i guess that's that's where you find them the most People are trying to use them everywhere, in IoT devices as well, uh, in, in small IoT gateways, for example. But um, yeah, there's practically no limitation to the use of a TPM. So if you need the functionality that it provides, then uh, you can put it anywhere. I want to go back just a moment. You said earlier that the TPM protects against the operating system. Is, is the TPM actually a, a device to protect a, a piece of hardware from from outside manipulation or outside hacking? Yeah, so maybe uh, to, to, to clarify, uh, it, it's not intended to protect against the OS, like the OS would be something malicious. It's actually uh, there to provide functionalities to the OS, like, for example, uh, protecting some keys or offering a random number generation of high quality to the operating system or also to assist with uh, providing to, let's say, a management system that tries to manage your enterprise laptop with information about the software that is running on that machine so that the management device can decide whether 
to trust it or not. So the idea is that the operating system would benefit from the TPM. Uh, the reason why it's a discrete component, so it's usually uh, isolated. Yeah, it's it's separate from the main CPU, or so so not and the same place where the operating system runs is because in case your operating system gets compromised or an attacker gets access to it or manages to install some remote malware in the OS, then the TPM wouldn't be affected by that simply because uh, the, the, the attacker would not be able to hack the TPM if you want, uh, just like it did for the operating system. And that's because of the the way the TPM is defined. There is a very uh, clear and um, well structured uh, API, so programming interface for using it. And you cannot just use it from you know from the side. So either you go through the to the right functionality to the right API, which means you might need to authenticate or you might need to prove that you have the right to use the TPM. So that's how it. Let's say remains protected even in the case that the operating system is uh, compromised. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. And in future TBM, the pivotal point is in the fact that quantum computing is coming. So the technologies you're working on now are to protect against some vulnerabilities in the age of quantum computing. Uh, first of all, can you tell us what quantum computing is? And then uh, why is this so critical? Well, without being an expert in <laughs> quantum computing, which is such an interesting and, and advanced uh, technical domain, uh, what we can uh, understand is that quantum computers are already functioning in, in a fundamentally different way than uh, traditional uh, computers that we, we use these days. And that uh, allows them to be extremely high performance at certain operations that would take a huge amount of time for a traditional computer to do. And one such operation uh, or, or a set of such operations could be related to, um, let's say, the crypto-related um, uh, mathematics that are used in our crypto algorithms. So, for example, um, you could use a quantum computer to find, let's say, the the, the private part of a, of, a, of a private public key pair like RSA or like ECC uh, with so high speed that practically uh, this difficulty of finding such a key is no longer uh, a problem for a quantum computer. And this practically would undermine the foundation of a lot of cryptographic algorithms which rely on hardness of computation. So the fact that it will take you maybe uh, hundreds of millions of years to 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 achieve reversing a, a public key in a private part or, or something like this. And with a quantum computer, it could be feasible in something probably from uh, months to days to hours. I, this I, I, <laughs> I cannot tell. So you can imagine now how uh, how important it is to have new crypto primitives that would be resistant to quantum computer potential attacks. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, practically the, the, the security of our entire informational society is at some point related to cryptography. And if that fails, we are practically left uh, uh, exposed to, to many types of attacks. But how far away is this? When we look at quantum computing, how much time do we have here? Yeah, that's always a, a, an interesting question. So there are various voices in the in the industry and as well in the academia which uh, are working on this uh, topic of quantum computers and some of them say that uh, it's still a long time away something in the order of 10 years maybe but there are others which are uh, saying that it could be maybe three to five years away what's important is that uh, previous forecasts since maybe five years ago have been uh, showing a tendency to accelerate um, by by looking at what uh, companies that work that build quantum computers have been able to do. So probably, uh, if we take this range of three to ten years, 
then that would give us a, a reasonably confident uh, assumption that uh, that's when we were going to see such a quantum computer. And that's why future TPM is in the timeline where it is, because these things could be here before we know it. Yeah. And the reality is that uh, it's not easy to select new algorithms and to standardize them and to ensure that they have uh, you no know, critical mass of adoption by the time that we have quantum computers. So the research in this area has to be early on and it has to be aligned with uh, efforts across industry and governments to identify what would be those algorithms that we should be putting our faith in uh, by the time we have quantum computers. Yeah, of course. And that's why it's a good thing we have projects like Future TPM looking out for us in these times. I'm wondering, you're building something that is quantum computing resistant. How is it that you can actually test when there is no quantum computing? How can you test your product yeah. Uh, again, I'm not an expert in, in quantum computers and uh, also I, I'm, I'm mostly learning from our uh, expert partners in quantum resistant cryptography. But as far as I understand, uh, there are a number of, um, let's say, mathematical constructs that are not expected to be accelerated by uh, the advent of quantum computers. So practically, I, I don't know how many uh, crypto researchers are effectively testing any algorithm on uh, that they would propose on a true quantum computer simply because they might not have access to one or it might not be fast enough. But as far as I understand, relying on these uh, mathematical foundations that are not expected to be susceptible to brute force acceleration by a quantum computer, uh, allows them already to to know that they are on the right uh, side of uh, of uh, of the solution space. So um, yeah, I guess that's that's more like uh, rela- relying on theoretical basis for ensuring that. And I suppose that's all you can do at this point, right? Yeah, unless you have a quantum computer running in your basement uh, that is uh, already able to 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 um, run these algorithms that would break existing crypto probably most of the research is done on a theoretical basis so looking at this project so far um, what kind of challenges have you faced with future TPM well um, for for my company and uh, the team uh, from my company that um, participates in this project, um, the challenges have been of several uh, types. First of all, it was our first uh, European project uh, that we participate in. So uh, it took, let's say, a a while to get used to all the process and uh, documentation expectations uh, that come with participating in such uh, uh, European funded projects. So that was the first thing we noticed. And going uh, on the technology aspects, practically, we, uh, we, we have a goal or, or let's say our task is to develop a network uh, device management demonstrator that uses uh, quantum resistant TPM. And some of the challenges have been related to uh, effectively integrating uh, the output of uh, our other partners, so these quantum resistant TPMs, uh, into our uh, use case. But uh, with, uh, let's say, uh, good, uh, good insights and uh, good collaboration, we were able to, to have a first validation already at uh, this integration. And uh, now we, we look forward to finalize with a, in, in a second round. So yeah, looks like we are able to, to overcome the challenges. And how is the COVID-19 lockdown, did that stop you from working as a group or I think most of what you do is remote anyways, right? You you have virtual meetings and you maybe come together a couple of times a year, but um, did this lockdown affect the group in any way? Well, we can imagine that it's not making it easier for us to collaborate, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like you mentioned, we, we used to have a, a weekly or monthly calls for various work packages in the project. So 
we were already in a setup where we could deliver our um, contributions effectively and, and in time. Now, um, yeah, we, we do feel the lack of uh, these face-to-face -face meetings, especially when we need to, uh, to summarize and to take uh, st decisions for the next steps. And uh, we try to compensate with more meetings, with more emails. And so far, I think we are doing uh, all right. I think as a consortium, we are uh, quite on track with uh, the timeline. Well, that's great. Uh, quite an accomplishment. Um, and I'd like to ask you, from your perspective and your company's perspective, um, what does success look like for you? From our side, um, participating in this project is first and foremost an opportunity to connect with the research community around uh, crypto, around trusted computing, around system security. And I would say uh, we, we already achieved this success because uh, we, we are well connected now with our partners and we have been able to, to collaborate together and to validate our uh, ideas to validate our concepts together and this is extremely important today in the security world because security that is not uh, accepted by um, expert community might not be so secure will never make it uh, you know to to the real life so that's for us the first important part and Second, of course, we work on, on technology uh, on our side. We absorb technology from our partners. So uh, eventually, uh, it looks like we are able to achieve the goals of having a quantum-resistant TPM, or at least a, a prototype or set of prototypes for such uh, devices, which would leverage quantum-resistant cryptography. And... Um, contributing the results of this project to international standardization or industry standardization bodies like the Trusted Computing Group, which is the originator of the TPM, that is already uh, a great success that we aim for. And it's not only that we aim for it, we are al already on the way for it because we have presented our uh, future TPM results to a technical committee and the TPM war group of the Trusted Computing Group. And they have been um, very uh, interested in these results and have found them helpful for their analysis of what kind of algorithms should be included in, in a, a subsequent revisions of the TPM specification. So that's roughly what I would consider a success for us. And as you mentioned earlier, you might have a, a solution to a problem, but if you're not recognized by some sort of body, then do you really have a solution? And by virtue of the fact that you have connections and you have the attention of the TCG or the uh, Trusted Computing Group, that really gives you some validation in this project and with all of the work that you're doing. Indeed. And being a research project, uh, it's always one of the best achievements to have results that are accepted by industrial communities, because that means they are valid and uh, ready for the market or um, able to support real needs of real products. Speaking of results, also, do you do you have the opportunity to publish papers during the process um, of this project? And is this then made available to other researchers? So I guess my question would be, are other research organizations able to leverage the things that you're doing because of the fact that you've published results? Certainly. By being a research project, one of the most important uh, validation is uh, publication, right? So... Uh, when others accept your result, it means that you are uh, doing a good job. And uh, in future TPM, we do this by um, publishing papers at uh, a number of um, well-known uh, conferences in security and cryptography, as well as uh, publishing our open source, uh, our, our contributions to the open source where possible. For example, in the use case demonstrator that uh, my company participates in, we have um, certain operating system technologies that we have been open sourcing uh, and we uh, work to have them reviewed and, and uh, eventually contributed to the Linux kernel. We also have had uh, a number of uh, 
presentations at various um, uh, venues such as open source uh, Linux Security Summit, as well as standardization bodies like uh, TCG, but also uh, ETSI. So we, we, we are uh, not only having the opportunity to publish, but we actively do it. And I know our academic partners are even more active in the academic conference arena. Yeah, and I think that's the only real way to push technology forward is this um, sharing of, of knowledge and information. So well done. Is there anything else about future TPM that we haven't covered? I would say there are many things, of course, that we could uh, discuss about. Uh, and um, probably we went through the most important for uh, our audience to to, to get um acquainted with the goals of the project and with what are we trying to do so um if 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 anybody wants to learn more about the project we have our future tpm.eu website where you can find uh, all the relevant deliverables that we have and as well a uh, news and uh, updates from uh, the project progress including papers published at conferences and a few other documents that uh, describe the project and also, we will be featuring a few more episodes from Future TPM within the next month or so. So uh, stay tuned for these episodes as well. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. It was good to learn a little bit about Future TPM and your role in the project. And we say thank you for your efforts in the project. And also thank you for taking a little bit of time today to keep us informed. Thank you as well, and uh, it was really a nice opportunity to talk, and we look forward to, uh, to, to having more dissemination information about the great results uh, that, that our consortium is achieving in this project. Great, thank you. For more information about Future TPM, visit futuretpm.eu. This podcast has been brought to you by Technica. This project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program under grant agreement number 779391.